hey, just dropping in to say we're now on Patreon. If you want to support the project, head on over to patreon.com slash legal listening, where you can unlock some fun bonus content with me, Zach, and some special guests. Thanks so much for all your support. Hey, welcome to Legal Listening, where audio obiter is our thing. We're Carly and Zach, and we're so glad you're here with us today. Today we're bringing you a special bonus episode, brought to you in collaboration with the folks over at the Legal Writers Collective. Go on and check them out on our website or at legalwriterscollective.com. Hope you enjoy! The Queen and Chung Supreme Court of Canada On appeal from the Court of Appeal for British Columbia, the judgment of Justices Brown, Rowe, Martin, and Kazerer was delivered by Justice Martin. Part 1. Introduction Mr. Chung was acquitted of dangerous driving causing death under Section 249.4 of the Criminal Code. At trial and on appeal, there was no question that Mr. Chung drove in an objectively dangerous manner and committed the actus reus of the charged offense. However, the trial judge had a reasonable doubt about whether Mr. Chung had the requisite guilty mind or mens rea. On appeal, the sole issue was whether the trial judge committed an error in law in finding that Mr. Chung lacked the requisite mens rea. The British Columbia Court of Appeal found such an error of law. Reading the trial judgment fully and fairly, I conclude that there was an error of law and that this appeal must be dismissed. Factual Background and Judicial History On the morning of Saturday, November 14, 2015, Mr. Chung drove his vehicle at almost three times the speed limit towards a major intersection in Vancouver and crashed into a left-turning vehicle. The driver of the left-turning vehicle died at the scene. The collision occurred at the intersection of two arterial roads in Vancouver, Oak Street and West 41st Avenue. This was a mixed residential commercial area with two gas stations, a community center, a nursing home, small retail businesses, and multiple bus stops around and near the intersection. Four pedestrians were in the vicinity of the intersection at the time of the collision. It was not raining, but the road was damp or wet. Traffic was light around the intersection, but other cars were present, and five civilian witnesses were called at trial who were all driving cars near the intersection at the time of the collision. The speed limit for both streets is 50 kilometers an hour, but drivers generally go above that speed limit. Both roads are wide and straight and have dedicated left turning lanes. A dashboard camera video from another vehicle at the intersection captured 4.9 seconds of the event. Over the span of a block, Mr. Chung had moved into the curbside lane, passed at least one car on the right, and accelerated from 50 kilometers an hour to 140 kilometers an hour before entering the intersection. The trial judge found that Mr. Chung was not inattentive, nor was he engaged in any dangerous conduct prior to this one block span. Mr. Chung was driving a powerful vehicle that could accelerate quickly. The trial judge heard expert evidence that the vehicle could accelerate from 0 to 100 km an hour in 4.5 seconds in dry conditions, although the trial judge made no finding regarding exactly how quickly Mr. Chung reached his top speed in damp or wet conditions. As Mr. Chung approached the intersection going north along Oak Street, there was a Toyota in front of him making a right turn. As the Toyota was turning right, the victim started to make his left turn from going southbound on Oak Street to eastbound on West 41st Avenue. At this point, Mr. Chung started braking, narrowly missed hitting the Toyota, and collided with the victim's car at a speed of 119 kilometers an hour. Taking into account all of the above circumstances, the trial judge found that Mr. Chung's excessive speeding over a short distance towards this major intersection was objectively dangerous to the public and that the actus reus of dangerous driving was established. However, the trial judge acquitted Mr. Chung because he had reasonable doubt that Mr. Chung's conduct met the mens rea requirement for dangerous driving. The trial judge distinguished the facts of the case from the circumstances where excessive speed met the mens rea requirement and emphasized that the momentariness of Mr. Chung's speed was critical in finding that his conduct did not show criminal fault. The British Columbia Court of Appeal found that the trial judge had erred in law by conceiving that a principle exists that a brief period of speeding, no matter how excessive the speed, cannot satisfy the mens rea requirement. 
The Court of Appeal therefore overturned the acquittal and entered a conviction, ruling that Mr. Chung would have been found guilty but for the trial judge's error. The sole issue in this appeal is whether the trial judge made an error of law which would allow the Crown to appeal Mr. Chung's acquittal under Section 676-1A of the Code. In these reasons, I first describe the types of errors that are reviewable by appellate courts for Crown appeals of acquittals. Second, I interpret the trial judge's reasons and explain how they demonstrate two interrelated errors of law concerning the interpretation and application of the test for mens rea for dangerous driving. Lastly, I address why I would dismiss the appeal and uphold the conviction entered by the Court of Appeal. Part 3. Reviewable Errors in Crown Appeals Under Section 676-1A, the Crown can only appeal an acquittal on a question of law alone. An appealable error must be traced to a question of law, rather than a question about how to weigh evidence and assess whether it meets the standard of proof. Therefore, the Crown cannot appeal merely because an acquittal is unreasonable. Errors of law arise, for example, where the legal effect of findings of fact or undisputed facts raise a question of law, and where there is an assessment of the evidence based on a wrong legal principle. These two types of errors are somewhat similar. They both address errors where the trial judge's application of the legal principle to the evidence demonstrates an erroneous understanding of the law, either because the trial judge finds all the facts necessary to meet the test, but errors in law in its application, or assesses the evidence in a way that otherwise indicates a misapprehension of the law. Part 4. The Errors of Law and the Trial Judge's Reasons Mr. Chung argues that there is no such error of law in the trial judge's reasons. I disagree. When interpreting a trial judge's reasons, appellate courts should not parse the reasons of the trial judge in a line-by-line search for errors. Instead, the reasons are to be read as a whole in the context of the evidence, the issues, and the arguments at trial, together with an appreciation of the purpose or function for which they are delivered. Appellate courts must attempt to understand the reasoning of the trial judge. However, even if the trial judge articulates the right test, Appellate courts may find an error of law if the judge's reasoning and application demonstrate a failure to properly apprehend the law. In this case, the trial judge thoroughly reviewed the evidence before him and made clear factual findings. He cited at paragraph 63 the correct test for the mens rea of dangerous driving causing death articulated in the Queen and Roy. Quote, the focus of the mens rea analysis is on whether the dangerous manner of driving was the result of a marked departure from the standard of care which a reasonable person would have exercised in the same circumstances. It is helpful to approach the issue by asking two questions. The first is whether, in light of all the relevant evidence, a reasonable person would have foreseen the risk and taken steps to avoid it if possible. If so, the second question is whether the accused's failure to foresee the risk and take steps to avoid it, if possible, was a marked departure from the standard of care expected of a reasonable person in the accused's circumstances, end quote. The trial judge found that Mr. Chung's dangerous conduct was only limited to the one-block span where he accelerated to almost three times the speed limit, passing at least one car on the right, nearly hit the Toyota turning right in front of him, and then collided with the victim's vehicle. The trial judge concluded that Mr. Chung had not been inattentive when driving. The trial judge then canvassed a line of cases which he believed supported the principle that speeding alone is rarely sufficient to establish the mens rea for dangerous driving. He distinguished these cases, finding that in these cases, speeding was more than momentary, or there was some other additional dangerous conduct that was not present in the case at bar. The trial judge emphasized that Mr. Chung's speed was momentary, noting that although momentary conduct can be a marked departure, it will more usually be only a mere departure where driving is otherwise proper. Therefore, he had reasonable doubt that Mr. Chung's conduct represented a marked departure because the momentariness of the accused's conduct in excessively speeding was insufficient to meet the criminal fault component. It would not be an error of law if the trial judge simply applied the test in Roy, considered all the circumstances, and came to an unreasonable conclusion regarding whether the accused's conduct displayed a marked departure from the norm. However, it would be an error of law if the trial judge failed to comprehend the accused's actions to what a reasonable person would have foreseen and done in all of the circumstances. 
This type of error is not a factual matter of weighing evidence, but rather it goes to the legal definition of the mens rea analysis for dangerous striving. Although the trial judge correctly cited passages from cases which express the applicable legal standards, I find two interrelated errors of law. First, I agree with the Court of Appeal that the trial judge erred by applying a wrongful legal principle. Second, and most importantly, I find that the trial judge failed to apply the correct legal test in Roy by not assessing what a reasonable person would have foreseen and done in Mr. Chung's circumstances. Applying a wrong legal principle and failing to apply the correct legal test are two sides of the same coin. Both characterizations go to the same essential error of law in this case, which was a failure of the trial judge to properly consider the conduct of the reasonable person in all of the circumstances in determining whether there was a marked departure. First, I agree with the Court of Appeal that the trial judge's fixation on the momentariness of the speeding demonstrates an error in law. Clearly, momentary excessive speeding on its own can establish the mens rea for dangerous driving where, having regard to all the circumstances, it supports an inference that the driving was the result of a marked departure from the standard of care that a reasonable person in the same circumstances would have exhibited. Although the trial judge recognized that momentary conduct could be a marked departure, the trial judge stated that his analysis turned critically on the fact that Mr. Chung's speed was categorically momentary, that the trial judge was relying on a legal principle rather than making a determination of fact is supported by his citation to Willock and the fact that he distinguished other cases where excessive speeding and acceleration occurred over a longer period of time or in conjunction with additional dangerous conduct. Read as a whole, his reasons indicate that he believed that when excessive speed was momentary, it was unable on its own to establish the mens rea for dangerous driving. The trial judge erred in focusing on the momentary nature of Mr. Chung's conduct, rather than analyzing whether the reasonable person would foresee the dangers to the public from the momentary conduct. A brief period of rapidly changing lanes and accelerating towards an intersection is not comparable to momentary mistakes that may be made by any reasonable driver, like the mistimed turn onto a highway in Roy, the momentary loss of awareness in the Queen and Beatty, or the sudden loss of control in Willock. Although this court in Roy and Beattie determined that momentary lapses in attention and judgment would usually not raise criminal liability, this was because momentary lapses often result from the automatic and reflexive nature of driving, or simple carelessness to which even the most prudent drivers may occasionally succumb. These are examples of conduct that, when assessed in totality against the reasonable person standard, only represent a mere departure from the norm. Momentary conduct is not assessed differently from other dangerous conduct. Conduct that occurs over a brief period of time that creates foreseeable and immediate risks of serious consequences can still be a marked departure from the norm. A reasonable person would have foreseen that rapidly accelerating towards a major intersection at a high speed creates a very real risk of a collision occurring within seconds. This is what actually occurred in Mr. Chung's case. Risky conduct at excessive speeds foreseeably can result in immediate consequences. Therefore, the fact that foreseeable consequences occur within a short period of time after someone engages in highly dangerous behavior cannot preclude a finding of mens rea for dangerous driving. Second, I find that the trial judge did not apply the correct legal test in Roy. In his reasons, he failed to determine whether a reasonable person in Mr. Chung's circumstances would have foreseen the risk from accelerating rapidly and speeding into that major intersection and taken actions to avoid it. This is not merely a matter of the trial judge failing to write out his thought process, but rather a matter of the trial judge not turning to the core question at issue, whether the dangerous manner of driving was the result of a marked departure from the standard of care which a reasonable person would have exercised in the same circumstances. The trial judge's reasons, interpreted as a whole, reveal that he failed to undertake this analysis. Although trial judges are not required to set out their analysis in any particular way, the two questions in Roy at paragraph 36 are helpful and emphasize the need to compare the accused conduct to the conduct of a reasonable person in their circumstances, and by reference to all relevant evidence. This is essential for determining objective mens rea. At some point in the mens rea analysis, 
the trial judge must work with the facts as found and consider whether, in the totality of the circumstances, a reasonable person would have foreseen the risk and taken the same actions as to the accused. Only when there has been an active engagement with the full picture of what occurred can the trial judge determine whether the accused's conduct was a marked departure from the conduct of a reasonable and prudent driver. Instead of focusing on what a reasonable person would have foreseen and done in the circumstances, the trial judge engaged in a reasoning focused on the type, speeding, and duration momentariness of Mr. Chung's conduct, to the exclusion of the full picture. His analysis focused on distinguishing cases where excessive speeding had been found to be a marked departure from the circumstances of this case, rather than examining the risks created by Mr. Chung's speeding. In other words, he focused on what Mr. Chung did not do in comparison to these other cases, rather than asking the correct legal questions and assessing what risks a reasonable person would foresee arising from Mr. Chung's momentary speeding in the circumstances. Had the trial judge turned to consider the circumstances of this case fully and specifically, he would have addressed the fact that Mr. Chung's conduct did not only include momentary excessive speeding, but also narrowly missing another vehicle turning right in front of him, passing in the curb lane, and accelerating towards a major intersection while aware of at least two vehicles in the intersection. The trial judge found that Mr. Chung was not inattentive while driving, but did not consider how Mr. Chung's awareness of his surroundings contributed to his conduct being a marked departure from the conduct of a reasonable person. A full analysis in this case would have considered the duration of the speeding, as well as the accused's control of the car, he switched lanes and then accelerated, the magnitude of the speeding, almost three times the speed limit, the location of speeding, approaching a major intersection, and the accused's awareness of at least two vehicles at the intersection as he approached it. The trial judge then had to consider whether, on these facts as found, a reasonable person would have foreseen the risk of endangering the public by engaging in this conduct and taken steps to avoid it, presumably not by driving so fast. The duration and nature of the accused's conduct are only some of the factors to be considered with all of the circumstances in the mens rea analysis. They are not factors that can be taken out of context. It is conceivable that in some contexts, even grossly excessive speed may not establish a marked departure from the standard of care, while in other circumstances, speed may not need to be grossly excessive in order to still be a marked departure. Courts must be careful to avoid fettering the analysis in Roy by adopting hard and fast rules regarding when isolated factors will or will not be marked departures. Although case law may be helpful in providing examples of what has previously been determined to be a marked departure, courts must still analyze the accused's actions relative to the reasonable person in the specific circumstances at issue. Part 5. Conclusion A reasonable person understands that driving is an inherently risky activity. It is made all the more risky the faster we drive, the harder we accelerate, and the more aggressively we navigate traffic. Although even careful driving can result in tragic consequences, some conduct is so dangerous that it deserves criminal sanctions. On the facts as found by the trial judge, over a one-block span, Mr. Chung moved into the curb lane, passed at least one car on the right, and accelerated to 140 kilometers an hour in a 50-kilometer zone while approaching a major urban intersection and being aware of at least two other cars in the intersection. There is no evidence that the accused lost control of his vehicle. Concerning the required mental element, it is not necessary to find that Mr. Chung was subjectively aware of the risk of his conduct and intentionally created this risk. The test for mens rea is based on the reasonable person. A reasonable person would have foreseen the immediate risk of reaching a speed of almost three times the speed limit while accelerating towards a major city intersection. Mr. Chung's conduct in these circumstances is a marked departure from the norm. The trial judge made all the findings of fact necessary to determine that there was a marked departure from the standard of care of a reasonable and prudent driver and therefore to support a verdict of guilty under section 686 sub 4 sub b sub 2 of the code. In other words, but for the error of law, the accused would have been convicted. I would therefore dismiss the appeal. Thanks for the listen, friend. I hope you're able to enjoy that case and learn something new from it. Legal Listening is founded by Zach Battiston and Carly Lyons. It is hosted by Zach Battiston, Carly Lyons, and you, our listeners. 
Executive produced by Zach Battiston, Carly Lyons, and Anthony Rademeyer. Audio engineering by Anthony Rademeyer. Graphic design by Julie Lundy. Check her out online at julielundyart.com. And music done by Matt Rademeyer at radandkel.com. At Legal Listening, we're always open to new ideas, suggestions, and of course, guest readers. Check us out on Twitter at Legal Listening or online at legallistening.com. Legal Listening, where audio obiter is our thing. We'll catch you in the next case. Bye now.